Hi, so I'm Jonathan Flake. I am the creator of Weelings in the Wild and the uh, owner of uh, Atomic Automaton. All right. So is Atomic Automaton a, a new company? What, what, what brought about its existence and that kind of stuff? Like, what's the story behind it? Yeah, so we're relatively new. Uh, we've been around for probably five years. Uh, we've had some games that were slated to be released a couple of years ago, but COVID you know, yeah. pushed all of our timelines back. And so we decided that, hey, you know, we can't really wait anymore. So it's time to start releasing these titles. So We Link in the Wild will be the first game uh, by the company, but we do have some other ones that are kind of scheduled to follow up as soon as this one gets fulfilled. Okay. And so what's kind of the story behind Weavelings in the Wild? Um, so Weavelings in the Wild is a puzzly solo card crawler, or I've heard it called a sliding puzzle game. Uh, so basically you are maneuvering through this four by three grid and you're collecting traps and you're using traps to capture beasties and those beasties will be turned into meat and you will use that meat to lure Weavelings out of the tender wilds uh, once you collect 10 population, you win the game. Um, and if you lose 10 population uh, or you suffer 10 wounds, then uh, you lose the game. You got to try again. Okay. Uh, the theme or the story is uh, the legendary fate Weaver Zadara has uh, put all her chubby little weavelings on the diet, and that has not gone over well for them. So <laughs> they've decided to go off to the Tender Wilds and get me in rebellion. Cause okay. What inspired you to make this kind of game? So I had a weekend gig, and there was a lot of downtime. And so I was looking for a game that I could play on my downtime. And so I was trying to find something that I could make that had a small footprint. And this is what kind of came out of it. The four by grid is relatively small. Uh, it was easy to you know, cut up. It was easy to take down. Uh, the theming actually came out of COVID. Um, I had these little weavelings, and I didn't know quite what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had put on a bunch of weight <laughs> from COVID, not doing anything, just kind of sitting around. Uh, and I thought, you know what, let's, let's put this weight gain to some good use and motivate me to <laughs> just accept the way the world is right now. And that's kind of where the, the theming came along. So it's a little quirky theme. It's a little bit different, but I'm also quirky and different. So I think it fits yeah. <laughs> the okay. vibe and the things that I'm doing. Okay. So the art in this is very colorful and playful. Um, who's the who's the artist? Um, I'm the artist, actually. Really? Yeah. So I did all the art, the design, the graphic design, the motion graphics, the videos, everything you see for Weelings in the Wild, uh, minus Keandra's voice acting, is me. So this has been a pretty intense labor of love. Uh, I'm really proud of it. Uh, I'm really proud of how it's being received and all the love that it's getting so far. Yeah. Uh, I have, like I said, like a quirky and off kilter personality. And so this kind of shows through with my art. It's very tongue in cheek. We wanted to do something that was like cutesy grotesque, something I don't really see very often in board games. Yeah. Uh, I was a little worried about how that would work because uh, I don't really see this kind of style that often. Uh, but we went to a proto spiel and got some feedback and everything went really well. So I'm pretty excited with it. So looking at some of the rules, because I got a chance to kind of glance over it a little bit. It seems like it's a pretty quick play. What do you suggest the average play time is probably for this kind of game? It's about 20 minutes. Um, it could be quicker or longer. It really depends on the player. Uh, I know this, like this will be, I have two solo card games that are um, kind of in the same series and that I've been playing it for so long. I got it down yeah. like, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, but some people really like to sit with the decisions and this mm -hmm. is a decision optimizing, you know, action point allocation kind of game. Okay. You're doing a little bit of hand management too. So some people just really like to sit there. And I think that's the great thing about a solo game is that you're allowed to, <laughs> you're allowed to have a little bit of an analysis paralysis, but it's not because there's too many choices. It's just because yeah. you want to optimize the choices that you do have. Uh, so I think it finds that, that good balance. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about 
you know, the gameplay itself. So how do you set up? It's a deck of 54 cards. You're going to pull out two. So you're going to pull out. There's a player aid that comes in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll remind you where everything goes on the game state. Uh, and then there's a trapper card. And the trapper card is you. Uh, that's who you're playing to collect all these traps and weavelings. Uh, and so what you'll do is you'll make a four by three grid uh, from the deck of cards. Of course, you'll want to shuffle these beforehand. Uh, and then you will place the trapper on the tender wilds. And uh, that's the tender wilds is like the game grid. So, okay. you know, they're one and the same. But uh, once trapper is on the board, you'll discard the card that you, you replaced it with. And uh, that's kind of the setup. Um, as far as gameplay, there's four distinct phases that you'll play through. There's the trapper phase. Uh, that's where you'll be moving the trapper around. You're going to be collecting traps. You're going to be using traps. You can also okay. collect. We have these wild spirits um, that are the local ghosts of the region. Mm -hmm. And you can collect those, and they will offer you boons that kind of help you on your journey. Uh, after the trapper phase, there is the lure weaveling phase. So if you are able to collect any meat, um, on your little journey, you can use that to lure weavelings off of the tender wilds. Uh, any lured weavelings, that'll be your population that you use to kind of win. Okay. Uh, after the lure weavelings phase, you have the beasties feed phase. And so on all the beasties cards, there are these little chomp icons. And the chomp icons will let you know what direction the beasties will feed. And they will feed on any nearby weavelings if you weren't able to kind of like pull them off the board. Um, yeah. The final phase is travel phase. And so you'll move deeper into the tender wilds. And when you move deeper, it'll push the bottom row of the grid out of the game. And then you'll yeah. draw from the wilds deck and put it into the top row. So there's always this um, organic kind of like push and pull. Um, it's got a little bit of a Tetris vibe. So anytime you pull cards off of the tender wilds, whether that's beasties or weavelings or anything, um, the game will collapse. It'll fill in those empty spaces, and then you'll put um, unrevealed cards to kind of fill in those gaps. Okay. Yeah. So honestly, it sounds like it's a it's a pretty fun solo game, and uh, when it came to playtesting and that kind of stuff, uh, was it pretty easy for people to kind of catch on to and you know make it pretty much a uh, seamless in, in that sense? I I know. Just from looking at everything that you have, you have poured years worth of stuff into this. <laughs> this is not this is not just something that you threw together in one day. This is something that you've been working on. Um, how long have you been working on on this universe? So the universe has been be being built out for it's been seven years. Uh, Imicus is where the game resides, and all the games actually uh, for our first few releases are all these interconnected storylines, anything that you do in one game will affect the outcome in another. Um, Zadara's uh, game, she's the one that kind of owns the Weavelings. Uh, mm -hmm. Her game comes out right after Weavelings in the Wilds. So they're all part of this very cohesive universe. Uh, Weavelings has, Weavelings specifically has been worked on probably about two years now. Um, hundreds of play tests. <laughs> I've captured a lot and lost a lot of weavelings over the course of the last two years. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's something that because it's our first release, we wanted to be extra cautious. So this has seen like two rounds of proto spiels, tons of internal play testing, tons of yeah. internal play testing. Um, so I'm really confident that we kind of nailed it. Um, you know, but it is to go back to your question about how easy is it to kind of pick this stuff up. Yeah. Uh, Weaklings in the Wilds actually offers a very unique set of uh, mechanics, and you don't see that very often. Mm -hmm. So it has some interesting milling mechanics. Um, so as you play the game, um, you'll slowly run out of cards. And once you run out of cards, you need to reshuffle the discard pile back into the Wilds deck. Okay. And what happens is, is every time you reshuffle your meat or your wounds and your weavelings that you've collected are going to rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. And those are your damage trackers. Those are your population trackers, uh, which 
isn't seen too much. So what we do have, and this is kind of like one of my design heuristics, is that most cards are multifunctional cards. So the beasts, the beasties are beasties, the beasties are me, or the beasties are wounds. So okay. they serve multiple purposes. Um, the back end of that, like the designer back end, the little secret under the hood stuff is that by removing these cards from the deck permanently, it's actually shrinking the deck and it's moving the game along quicker. Okay. And eventually you're going to take more wounds the longer that you're there. Uh, the weevlings will become a little restless. And if you take too long, they're going to require more meat from you. Um, so it's supposed to create this sense of urgency. Yeah. And kind of move the game along. Uh, so we got these interesting milling mechanics that I don't really see. BGG actually didn't have an entry for milling. So I had to just say milling. I couldn't link it on BGG's website. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, so milling, and it's got some hand management, like I said, action point um, selection stuff. Uh, so it is a, a unique suite of mechanics, which I think is what gamers are really looking for. They're always looking for new combinations of these things. The Weebling yeah. definitely offers this stuff. Okay. How many like different kind of difficulties are there for this kind of game? So we have an easy mode. Um, that isn't the standard. Mm -hmm. um, we have so we have easy, we have normal, we have hard, we have subcategories of hard where you're removing different amounts of wild spirits. Those are the guys that are going to offer you the boons to help you along. Okay. Uh, and then we have nightmare mode, which changes some of the mechanics of the game, makes it more difficult. Uh, if you play normal or hard. Uh, when you go through travel phase and the cards get pushed out, certain cards won't get pushed out. So unrevealed cards will not get pushed out of the wild. So you can kind of strategize and move the trapper to kind of block certain columns to kind of stop the milling mechanic a little bit. Okay. Um, so there's some strategy there with like uh, game state gameplay and manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, what the nightmare mode does is it, it pushes those unrevealed cards out. So you really have a shorter primer to kind of, you know, finish this game up. So what we, when we were designing this, it was during COVID. It was during uh, like inflation. So mm -hmm. that was something that was really important to me to make sure that gamers are getting the most for their dollars. Yeah. Uh, and it was also important to me that we have a very good price point. So I feel like the amount of gameplay that we're giving and the price point and the quality of the materials, uh, we were going to do a tuck box. Yeah. Uh, I've opted against it. So it's a really nice telescopic, sturdy box. I'm, I'm really happy with the quality of it. Uh, we also have two stretch goal expansions planned, so that's some additional content. Um, and the game, the base game comes with a certain amount of traps, like set traps that you use. Yeah. So one of the expansions, uh, Zadara's Bobbles and Brews, it allows you to kind of customize your deck a little bit. Okay. Picking traps and, you know, mix and matching and, and choosing like the gameplay style that you like. So I really like that little expansion. Uh, then there's a larger one. Uh, it's called Star Touch Predators. And that one is a whole new suite of beasties, and those beasties are more difficult. They have more difficult abilities that uh, manipulate the Tender Wilds, unlike the base game. And okay. there's some new events, which just make it a little bit more difficult <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's one of those things where you have enough stuff coming out in this upcoming Kickstarter that uh, there's going to be lots of replayability. There's definitely like, especially with the traps, like uh, Zadara's Bubbles and Brews, a lot of those are um, uh, game state manipulation cards. And uh, that's pretty different from the base game. And mm -hmm. uh, there's also just a really fun, it's, we, we're always trying to lean into theme. So she's kind of like a psychic. We call her a fate weaver. Uh, and so one of the trap cards is you trying to predict what the next card is in the deck. And if you're able to predict it, then, you know, there's certain effects that happened. Yeah. Um, so there's some fun little things like that. But definitely Star Touch Predators takes the game into a much different direction. Um, it has those BC abilities, like I said. It also has some pretty gnarly mi milling mechanics in it. So if you're looking for a challenge, if you're looking for something that's definitely more difficult than the base game, yeah, uh, that's that's something that's there. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that there's room for sleeves in the box, and so 
uh, there's enough room for that because it is a game that you're going to be shuffling. So we wanted to make sure that our sleevers were taken care of. Okay. Uh, and there's still a little bit of room in there. Um, <laughs> so depending on, uh, you know, uh, if people really like this set of mechanics and they want to see more, uh, I do have something planned for the future, which will, you know, expand on the little Weavelings universe and add more gameplay and, and add more yeah. variety. That's definitely like a goal. Uh, we just have to see uh, how it's received. Go back to a little bit more of the world building and story building. How did you approach that concept? Yeah, so the, the world building has been kind of a, a long, long process. I mean, I started this stuff in high school. Just an uh, introverted nerd drawing in the corner, <laughs> um, drawing little weird creatures and stuff. And so this stuff has kind of followed me over the course of a long time. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit. And mm -hmm. I've been drawing and making art forever. So the world was there. It was just ready to kind of be, you know, condensed and made into something cohesive. And mm -hmm. so a lot of this is just kind of pulling um, from everything that I've made over the course of my whole life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's kind of like where it all started. And now it's just, there's a timeline and there's a storyline that's in my head. And so what we're trying to do uh, at Atomic Automaton is just make sure that every game, no matter what kind of game, no matter how small, how big, uh, it's going to tell a story. Uh, I used to play Magic when I was a youngling. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, magic, like Dark Ages, Revised Edition <laughs> Magic. Okay. And... Uh, I realized I went to a tournament. We played at the Queen Mary, and I realized that I was playing wrong because somebody had corrected me. But I guess you're supposed to put your land closest to you, and I would put my creatures closest yeah. to you. So I had it flipped, and it didn't really make a lot of sense to me because I was so emotionally tied to my creatures. I felt yeah. like, oh, these are my guys. You know, why wouldn't I want them closer? And uh, the person that corrected me was like, well, you know, you want your power, the source of all your power close to you. That makes sense. Uh, and I've always had this kind of backwards view with those things. And so yeah. everything that I do is like character driven. And I want you to have an emotional connection to these creatures and characters and ephemera that you're interacting with. And I think, quite frankly, that's kind of like a blind spot in the board game industry mm -hmm. is I don't really feel emotionally connected to most of these games that I play. And I really want you to feel that. So there's so much extra art for Weavelings. There's so much extra art for a lot of these games that we're coming out with. And that's because you're not giving just a 54 card game, 90 cards with an expansion. You're yeah. getting a universe to try to, you know, engross yourself in and become a part of. Uh, and you got a sneak peek of the Kickstarter page and, you know, we have some special guests from the universe that are going to come and visit and, you know, they're going to teach you more about the lore in kind of this organic way. And um, I think that's important, especially if you're trying to develop like an IP mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you're just a gamer looking for something cohesive and consistent, like you need to know what you're going to expect from a developer. And I think all this stuff is is how i feel about you know building this emotional connection to things yeah yeah and i mean it's obvious just from and whenever they get a chance to actually see the kickstarter page they're going to realize how much dedication you have to this because you've created all the art for the kickstarter page as well and it's very organized and how much <laughs> I, well, yeah, no, I was I was reading through it the other day, and I was like, man, there's a lot of stuff on here, but that's good. Um, there's gonna yeah, be some yeah. there's gonna be some social goals too, right? Um, during the yeah, campaign, yeah, so we have social goals. Um, uh, a lot of people don't do social goals anymore, but we're like a small little startup indie company, and so any kind of extra likes and shares and love that people can share is super helpful for us. We are going against the Simons of the world, right? Yeah, uh, Simon can just launch whatever they want and then they have like 2,000 pre-launch backers no matter yeah. how much shipping costs right <laughs> exactly uh, but we're just not Simon so uh, we're a little grassroots gritty hustling kind of company and uh, uh, that's why we want to offer that and it's not just social goals for the sake of arbitrary social goals um, mm -hmm. I've attached alternative art to that 
So I took the extra effort and, you know, made different art for all the population one weavelings. You'll see that in the, the Kickstarter page. Um, yeah. And that's with some other things that we have going on. We'll have a, uh, not to give too much away, but I'm sure if people are watching this, it's probably on the Kickstarter page by now. Uh, we'll be adding alternative outfits for the trapper, um, just little things, you know, to, uh, you know, pull you into this world a little bit more because that's that's ultimately yeah. the goal and that's the most important thing for me i mean the mechanics are important too <laughs> all, all the suite of mechanisms and stuff but uh that's already there you know yeah. you see that and hopefully in all games have their their mechanisms sorted out and stuff but i i'm trying to like offer something unique that you don't see too often and even with the marketing uh that was something that we really wanted to do all the marketing art is original as well Okay. So we didn't just take screenshots or take pictures of components or the box cover. Uh, every advertisement is a unique kind of expression of the world. And I hope that shines through. What kind of social media channels do you guys have now um, that they can follow you guys on to learn more about this kind of stuff and engage with so, you? Yeah, so we're on almost everything not everything i haven't gotten my my dances down for TikTok quite yet uh, and nobody wants to see that so no TikTok. <laughs> um but we're on instagram and facebook and uh youtube just so, for, so we can put our trailers and how to play videos and whatnot um the website is a great resource i'm always blogging on there um where else we we have a link tree <laughs> so if you just type in atomic automaton you'll find us or you'll find a band that has the same name as us we're not the band we're the yeah. publishing company okay uh, but yeah we're we got the bgg page all that kind of stuff so if you just search us on google you'll find us at twitter um but like i said you know part of this is audience building too yeah i've had uh like buyers come out and reach out that they're ready to already kind of stock the game and mm -hmm. bypass kickstarter altogether but part of kickstarter is building a relationship with your community and kind of growing that community and yeah. that's like a fledgling company that was a, a big thing that we wanted to do is you know build an audience and build relationships with people uh relationships not transactions is like kind of a, one of our core values yeah so communication is important uh these relationships with people are important because at the end of the day you know these backers and these content creators and everybody else that's kind of involved in this is how you you know survive you know they're the dream makers yeah you put it out there but you know they're the ones that are helping you kind of bring everything to life okay and honestly, that's that's really one of the things that a lot of companies need to kind of remember and, and kind of get back to is building the relationship with the community. And honestly, I think you're on the right path, and I think it's going to end up really good. And um, how long is the campaign going to be? So it'll run for 30 days, so from August 30th to September 28th. Uh, and we have a campaign calendar so every day during the week minus weekends unless there's some special content that gets released we'll have little goodies and um ways to kind of connect with us more uh fridays during the campaign i'll do amas on discord so you can come and ask me any questions i make myself available to you uh we'll be doing little mystery bags and so inside those mystery bags are fun little goodies um set in the world of imicus that you can use to kind of um, get a little bit more entrenched in the world. Uh, there's some cute, fun stuff that I haven't seen before, so I'm excited to kind of reveal those things. Uh, yeah, we're just trying to you know, keep everybody engaged and have a good time while we do this, because 30 days is a long time. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's a long time to keep people kind of coming back. Okay, and so what kind of different tiers are you guys offering in, in your campaign? Or so we wanted to, what did it say, KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we have some more complicated games coming out. And originally, um, Weavelings in the Wilds and Fate Weaver Zadara and her unfortunate misfortune were going to be paired together. Um, but we got good feedback where Weavelings needed to be its own separate game. And so we were going to run uh those two campaigns together but we decided to split them up um so we wanted to just keep it simple because part of the reason not only was weavelings fine for its own game um it made the pledges too complicated mm -hmm. 
So I wanted to, this is the first foray into this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with like logistics companies and fulfillment companies and, you know, manufacturers and the easier that you can make it on yourself. This is my notes for other designers. <laughs> mm. Hey, I have the big games coming out. People tell you, don't do the big games, but I'm like, oh, you, you just want to do the easy game just to make your life easier because it gets pretty gnarly. So, you know, mm -hmm. you got to get U UPC SKUs and all that kind of fun stuff. So there's long story short, there's only one pledge. Mm -hmm. There's the core game. Uh, we do have stretch goals to increase the quality of that. And that's what we want to make ideally is that will increase the um, the thickness of the box and, yeah. uh, you know, linen finishes, all that kind of nice stuff. Um, but one pledge. So $20 pledge gets you the core game. And then we have, we were able to work with our fulfillment company and they were able to bundle the game in boxes of twos and fours and so then you can save some money on shipping so those are kind of our group pledges mm -hmm. and all that shipping information is on um, the kickstarter page so what i encourage people to do is make some friends during the campaign or you know get some presents for christmas for people uh and or birthday presents because it'll probably be after christmas for fulfillment but uh um, that's the best way to save on shipping because shipping's kind of crazy right now and there's only so much that we could do as a yeah. indie publisher um, so that was our best way around that is offering kind of these, these group pledges. Okay. And when the campaign is live, um, there's going to be a tabletop simulator demo, right? Yeah. So the tabletop simulator is live now. So you can go and, uh, we have that on our website. So you just click the link and go play it for yourself if you want. Um, and then I have the, how to play videos and how to use all the traps. So. You can kind of figure it out yourself if you're really aching to play some Weavelings. But yes, uh, so the first Friday of the campaign, I'll be running tabletop simulators, just kind of showing people how it plays. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't get it from the videos. And then um, the third week of the campaign, I will be doing another um, set of tabletop simulator games and it'll be for an hour and I'll, I'll put in the expansion pack so you can kind of see those as well and how those play. Uh, and then the weeks in between that, I'll just be doing art and you can watch me paint and ask me questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jonathan, for talking to us about Atomic Automaton and Weaklings in the Wilds. Um, their Kickstarter yeah. campaign is launching soon and we will be following it closely. Um, it is a passion project, but it is also a very realistic project. Yes. <laughs> I'm neurotic. It has to be realistic. It has to be pragmatic. <laughs> Yes. All right. <laughs>